I am super glad that you're here. If you brought a Bible, I want you to open it to Matthew chapter 3. We are going to read about the baptism of Jesus, Matthew chapter 3. I don't know if you've ever considered this or, or pondered this idea, but in our culture, the way we live, especially in the South, South Georgia, um, it is very important that we remember certain things. We go to great lengths to make sure that we don't forget. We want to make sure that we remember things that are important. Uh, we'll print up t-shirts to make sure we remember a person or an event. We'll build a monument. Uh, we'll build a building. We'll name a park. We will go to great lengths to make sure that we remember certain things. If you ever walk through uh, a cemetery, for instance, and you just go headstone by headstone by headstone, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, in my position and with my profession, I'm in cemeteries quite often. Uh, and you just look around at the vast number of names and lives that are represented by that single little dash between a date of birth and a date of passing, and you're forced to remember important people, people we love, people we miss. Uh, when veterans travel to our nation's capital, they almost always visit the monuments like the Vietnam Wall to remember their fallen heroes, loved ones, men and women who paid the ultimate price. And it seems important to us, at least at this stage in our culture, that we remember. Uh, the Freedom Tower was built in place of the World Trade Centers to remind us that there are others in this world who would like to erase our freedom. The building itself helps us remember. It is a visual reminder. I find it interesting with the division in our nation today that when you stop and think about the importance of remembering, notice which side wants to remember which event. One side wants to remember certain events. Uh, the other side wants to remember other events. What we remember often defines who we are by what we believe. Last time we met, we examined uh, the Lord's Supper. We gathered around the Lord's table. We celebrated communion. Communion is a service that's dedicated to remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, in addition to the importance of remembering in our culture, it is also very important in our culture that we identify ourselves with certain people or things or events. The very fact that I'm wearing this Cleveland Browns jersey, and this is the whole reason I wore it today, I am identifying myself with an NFL football team, not a Super Bowl winning football team yet, but a football team nonetheless. If you saw me in town wearing this jersey, you would think to yourself, he's obviously a Browns fan. He's obviously a Nick Chubb fan, all right? Because the jersey identifies me as such. We do the same thing culturally across the board from West Coast to East Coast. We will literally mark our bodies with tattoos. We will alter our clothing uh, we will wear a headdress even or some kind of jewelry to identify ourselves with some person or some movement or something very important. If you go to a Georgia Southern football game and you see that, you understand that that eagle is associated with Georgia Southern football. If you travel to Athens and you run into Ugga, when you see Ugga on the sidelines, which by the way, Florida fans... Let me just take a moment to gloat. <laughs> Tom, I love you. Alan, I love you. All the Florida fans that are among us, I love you, but man, yesterday was a good day. <laughs> if you spot Ugga on the sideline, it's obvious to you that you are about to be treated to some of the finest football ever in existence to the common man. If you spot a family dressed like this, you know almost immediately this is either an Amish family or a Mennonite family. Uh, they live in different places. They 
handle themselves differently. And, and we all know this because of the outward appearance, the way the dress is on the outside. We associate that with an inner belief system. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's what this is today. Baptism is an outward demonstration of something that we believe on the inside. And most importantly, baptism identifies us with Jesus Christ. That's what it does. Hear me, church. The waters of baptism do not wash away sin. Stop thinking that. The waters of baptism merely demonstrate we're identifying ourselves with a person who has washed away our sin, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, in the New Testament, there are two ordinances, two practices for the church that were ordained by Jesus Christ himself. That's why we call them ordinances, because he told us to do them. The practice of communion is a practice designed to help us remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. The practice or the ordinance of baptism is a practice to encourage us to identify ourselves with the risen Jesus Christ. God wants us both to remember the cross and he wants us to identify with his son. Now, last time, Tyler put it this way and I loved it, so I want to show it to you again. Communion is an ordinance of renewal. Communion began as Passover. Every year in the springtime, Jewish people are reminded that thousands of years ago, God supernaturally delivered them from their bondage in Egypt, their slavery under Pharaoh, and led them into their promised land. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed at the Last Supper, commandeered Passover and turned it into the Lord's Supper, what we understand it today, communion. Jesus said, now this represents my broken body and my shed blood. That's what the cup and the bread are supposed to do. And by remembering periodically when we gather, we're renewed. When it comes to baptism, baptism is an order, ordinance of commitment. See, when someone is baptized, what they're demonstrating to you is that they are committed to following Jesus Christ. Here's the way I want to put it to you today. Make it very simple using two words. Here they are. At communion, we remember, and in baptism, we identify. That's what it is. Now, if you think that Jesus invented baptism, I'm sorry to, sit to tell you you're mistaken. Jesus did not invent baptism. Baptism has been around long before Jesus ever came on the scene. You'll remember John the Baptist or John the Baptizer was in the process of baptizing people in the Jordan River when Jesus introduced himself publicly into ministry. We're not sure exactly where or when it first originated, but what we do know is that it's been around for a very, very long time. In the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 16, for instance, there's an example of the high priest engaging in a ceremonial bath before he offered the sacrifice. The bath didn't clean the priest or wash the priest. His confession and the sacrifice did that. The bathing was simply ceremonial that God had accepted his confession and God had accepted his sacrifice. That's what baptism has always been throughout the Bible. Not the big deal itself, but a symbol of the big deal. Now, when I study through my Bible, Old and New Testament, I count at least seven different kinds of baptisms. I've listed them for you. We'll begin with the baptism of Moses, for instance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul said that the Old Testament Hebrews were, quote, baptized into Moses when they followed Moses across the Red Sea. So follow me here. By following Moses through the Red Sea, Paul is saying they were identifying themselves with God's leader, Moses. The second one is the baptism of suffering. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus is hanging out with his disciples, and they know he's about to go and suffer. They say, we want to go with you. And Jesus says, wait a minute. Do you think you can drink from this cup that I'm about to drink from? Do you think you're capable of suffering the kind of agony and death that I'm about to suffer? So in effect, what Jesus is doing is he is identifying himself as the Son of God by the suffering of the cross. We call that the baptism of suffering. There's the baptism of John. 
John the Baptist, again, or John the Baptizer in Matthew chapter 3. We'll read about it in a moment. John's baptism represented the person's willingness to turn from their sin. John's baptism is called a baptism of repentance. Repentance means stop, think it over, turn around, and go in a different direction. When John baptized in the Jordan River, he was baptizing people who were turning, they were repenting from their sin. And then there's the baptism of Jesus. Again, we'll read about it in a moment in Matthew 3. Think about it. Jesus had no need to repent. Jesus had no sin to wash away. The reason Jesus got baptized, according to his own words, was to, quote, fulfill all righteousness. Jesus got baptized to identify himself with God's plan for personal righteousness. Here's number five, the baptism of fire. In this one passage that we're going to read about in a moment, we're going to read about three of these seven, well, four, you could say, of these seven baptisms. There's John's baptism because he's the one doing the baptizing when Jesus comes along. There's Jesus' baptism. Then there's the baptism of fire and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The context of the passage we'll read in a moment explains the baptism of fire. One day, judgment is coming on this planet, and God will use fire to identify his true followers. That's called the baptism of fire. I am identified by the fire. Here's number six, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This baptism is spoken of both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and in each individual case, this baptism is hand-delivered by Jesus Christ himself. There are many people who believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was reserved for a remarkable, time-altering happening or event or circumstance, such as the Holy Spirit coming upon Samson in the Old Testament or David in the Old Testament. Jesus hand delivers the Holy Spirit for a specific purpose and a specific reason. There are many Bible scholars who believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit is reserved or was reserved for the first century church apostles. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit hand delivered by Jesus Christ that enabled them to perform miraculous signs and wonders. In effect, they were identifying themselves with the authority given them by God by being being able to do the works of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, number seven, the baptism in the name of Jesus comes from Acts chapter two. This is the baptism that we're going to practice today in the later service. The people who are being baptized today have identified themselves with Jesus Christ. They're not associating themselves with anything else. They're certainly not associating themselves in the waters of baptism with Moses. They're not associating themselves with uh, suffering or fire, or anything else. They're simply saying, it is my desire to follow Jesus Christ. I identify myself with Jesus Christ. Let's read about this in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. John is in the Jordan River, and he's baptizing all the people who are walking down with him, and the Pharisees are watching from a distance. Verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. Remember, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was designed to demonstrate my sorrow from my sin and to turn from it. Now, the reason that's important is because in contrast to the religious supermen of the day who were watching from the hillside, the Pharisees, who believed that they had enough good works built up. They were self-righteous in and of themselves. They didn't need to turn from any sin because they believed they had none. John is saying everyone needs to turn from their sin. Everyone needs to repent. So I baptize you in the water for repentance. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, he says. Again, there are two of the seven, the Holy Spirit and the fire. The context of the fire is going to be explained in verse 12. Look at it. His winnowing fork is in his hand. That is a symbol of judgment. And he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
One day, and we just studied about these events several months ago, one day Jesus Christ will return to judge the sin of the earth. And when he does, he will use fire to identify his followers from his rejectors. Verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. We can all relate to that, right? How would I feel if Jesus walked through those back doors of this auditorium? I'd say, I'm done. Someone else has the floor. How would you feel? How would you feel if you're John and you're in the water and you're baptizing these people? John's gospel, for instance, not the same John, but John's gospel, for instance, said when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he tapped his followers and he said, behold, the Lamb of God, the kingdom of God is upon us, John said. Then Jesus comes to be baptized. John tries to deter him. I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, follow me. John didn't know the entire plan of God as Jesus did. John's baptism was one of repentance. Jesus needs to connect John's baptism with his own baptism to complete the picture. John's baptism was, I'm sorry for my sin. I know I'm wrong. I turn from my sin. The baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is the only one who can cover that sin is Jesus Christ himself. So when you add the two together, repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ, you complete the picture for, quote, God's plan of righteousness. That's why we need to do this. So John consented. Verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment the heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from the heaven said, this is my Son, who I, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Did you notice in verses 16 and 17, in one place, in one moment in time, we have all three members of the Trinity. We have the voice of the Father, this is my Son, I love Him, I'm pleased with Him. We have the Son of God in the water being baptized, and we have the Spirit of God descending like a dove, all three members of the Trinity. Now, sometimes someone will ask me, what's the biggest difference between the church today, our modern church in America, and the church of the first century? the early church of the apostles. There are many differences. If you read through the book of Acts, you're going to find, you're going to read about a church that is very unlike the church we know today. Now, some of that's good and some of that's natural with the progression of time, but some of it not so much. The biggest difference I see between the first century early church and the church today is one that troubles me greatly. Here it is. The early church was a community of Christ followers. I chose that word on purpose. I didn't say a group of Christ followers. I didn't say a congregation of Christ followers. I said a community of Christ followers. Community implies connection. Community implies relationship. Community implies we're not just a group of people that show up for an hour once a week. We are actually connected with one another. Now, let's be real and let's be honest. In the church the size of this one, you can't possibly know everyone, but I hope you're connected to someone because that's what church is. Church is a community of Christ followers, watch, committed, not just involved, committed. You know the difference between involvement and commitment? If you woke up this morning and had bacon and eggs for breakfast, that chicken was involved in your breakfast, but that pig was committed to it. See? See? That's the difference in the two. So follow me. The early church was a community of Christ followers committed. They were committed to a common mission. What was that mission? The Great Commission. Jesus, before he ascended to the Father, he looked at his closest followers and he said, go into all the world and tell my story. Share the gospel. Make disciples and baptize them. That's the mission of the church. And then when they gather together, they gather for worship. Now, look around the church in America. Is that what you see? Here's what I see today. 
Today, the church is more a collection of religious people. We're a little more religious than the other guys, so we go to church on Sundays. We're not a community because we really don't want to be bothered by other people and their problems. We're a group. We're a congregation. We're a collection of religious people, and we don't share a common mission because we're not willing to commit really to anything other than what interests us. Instead, we share common interests. Oh, I go to this church because I love their music. Man, I go to this church because I love their children's program. Man, I go to that church because I love that speaker and that teacher. Man, I go to this church because it's close to my house. Man, I go to this church because every Wednesday night they serve spaghetti. Instead, we're a collection of religious people who share common interests, and then we go to a building when it's convenient, and we call it church. Big difference between the church today and the church of the first century. This is why the practice of baptism is so very important to this church. This is one of the reasons I baptize by immersion and prefer it. Immersion means dunk somebody under the water. It's because of the symbolism that's associated with it. You see, the people getting baptized today are not simply religious. They're not just trying to do the next religious thing on their list. They're actually committed You see, they're not just interested in some of the things this church offers their family. I I get so tickled. I get so tickled with that question on communication cards. I guess after I say this and enough people hear it, I'll never get the question again. Tell me, Pastor Mike, what can this church offer me and my family? If you've chosen a church based upon what it offers you and your family, you have chosen for the very wrong reason. The symbolism of baptism is super important. We start with the word follow. Follow. When someone is baptized, here's what they're doing. They're, quote, following the example set by Jesus in Matthew 3. We just read about it. They follow Jesus in baptism. Okay? That's why at this church we use the term Christ follower. The Bible uses the term disciple. I very rarely use the term Christian because Christian, unfortunately, has become more of a political term than anything else in our nation, at least. 69% of born-again Christians in America believe this or voted for that person or support this effort. Okay? The Bible uses the term disciple, Christ follower. That's what baptism rec- represents. Baptism identifies a person as a follower of Jesus Christ. Then, when I put him in the water and I take him under... That symbolizes death. The death of Jesus Christ, because they're not counting on their own righteousness, they're counting on the righteousness he provided at his death. His broken body, his shed blood, his death. But they're also dying themselves to their sin. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple if you're not willing to carry your own cross and deny yourself. You know what that is? That's dying to self. So baptism symbolizes following Jesus, dying to self, trusting his death on the cross, and then, boom, resurrection. One day when this body expires and they put it in the ground, I am hopeful and knowledgeable based upon the promise of Scripture that my body will be resurrected. Paul called Jesus and his resurrection the first fruit of resurrection. What's that mean? That means that Jesus' was the first resurrection among billions to follow. In addition, until that happens, until my body is resurrected one day, I'm resurrected symbolically to a new way of life, a new way of living, a new way of thinking. Now look, before I quit, let me just have a quick word to parents. Parents, this is one of the big reasons that I stress to you, put your child's baptism off as long as you can. Wait as long as you can to ask for your child to be baptized. Wait until they can at least understand partially what I'm describing to you today. Parents, stop assuming that somehow baptism seals the deal. Like, my kid learned in Kids Jam that Jesus died on the cross for them, that he was buried, that he rose again. Kids Jam taught my child the answers to five very important questions. Now what we need to do is get that kid in the water, baptize him, and seal the deal. Then as a parent, my job is over. Stop thinking like that. 
Stop thinking like that. See, there are a lot of six-year-olds who can tell you that Jesus died and rose again, but they have no concept of repentance and authentic faith. They have no desire whatsoever to deny themselves and follow after Jesus. And that's what Jesus said it takes. Pray with your children. Talk to them about following Jesus when it's easy and when it's not so easy. In your living room, you can pray, they can pray, they can tell God it's their intention to follow Jesus. By the way, that's what brings us into a right relationship with God, is when our will bows, when our intention shifts, and we decide to follow wholeheartedly a risen Savior. One of the big problems with trying to, quote, convert children is getting them to admit they're sinners, I can't tell you how many times my wife has stood over there with your third graders or your second graders and said, raise your hand if you're a sinner, and not one hand will be raised. I assume they're thinking to themselves, if I raise my hand, someone's going to write down my name and tell my mom. (laughs) Kids don't think of themselves as sinners. Well, listen to me, church. How can they see their need for a Savior if they don't recognize their need to be saved from anything? You saw at the beginning of that video at the first part of our service, there are many, many churches out there who've presented Jesus traditionally and historically as a get out of hell free card. We don't present him that way at Grace because there's a big difference between I can answer five questions correctly and I've been baptized and it is my sincere desire to follow Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm getting at, parents? I would much rather baptize a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old who's been anticipating baptism for a long time. They're excited about it because they've decided to follow Jesus. I'd much rather baptize that young person than a 7-year-old who's just simply learned all the correct answers to my questions in Kids Jam. I hope you understand, parents. Now, I don't know how many churches you could visit in America today and find the pastor wearing a Browns jersey, probably not too many. Not because there aren't a lot of Browns fans out there. But because in most churches, this doesn't fit. Grace Community Church has never really been a particularly religious church. We've never set as one of our goals being kind of high and stuffy and whatever. In fact, years ago, we used to baptize in swimming pools after the service. We got a group of people to baptize. We'd get in a a caravan, and we'd drive out of here, and we'd go to someone's house who lived close. We'd gather up in their backyard. Everybody would get in the pool. We'd baptize there. Do you know why? Because when we built this building 20 years ago, I didn't want one of those grand, elevated, kind of centrally focused baptistries built into the wall, the main wall of the church, where everybody sits out there, they, they see it. You know, it's got that little glass window, and it's got that cartoon painted river at the back. Hear me, church, not because there's one thing wrong with that, nothing at all. But remember, this church was established to get non-religious people to finally come to church. This church was set up to try to get skeptical people to try to come to church. And I did not want the first thing they saw to be one of those baptistries when they walked in the back doors. But in spite of our desire to be as less, as in spite of our lack of religious pretension, that doesn't mean we're not serious about the authenticity of our faith. In fact, I'll fight you tooth and nail that it might mean we're a little more serious about it. Because we don't want to be distracted by the things that don't matter. Baptism matters because baptism represents someone's desire sincerely to simply follow Jesus. They can't do it themselves, therefore they trust the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they trust it so intently that they're willing to die to themselves and raise a new person. So I leave you with a question. A simple question, but I hope you'll consider it. Have you ever identified yourself with Jesus Christ? have you? Let's pray. Father, I pray that we will take our faith seriously. I pray we'll be honest with ourselves. Father, I pray you'd open our eyes to the reality that it is so much easier to be religious than it is to deny our own self-sovereignty. It is so much easier to be religious than it is to carry a cross. Father, 
We don't want simple, easy belief around here. We want genuine, authentic faith. And Father, may we demonstrate that faith by the level of our commitment. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, Grace Community Church. I hope you make it a fantastic week. I will see you next time.